back on our time schedule. Uh, this is uh, good for all of us, of course. So I would now like to pass the floor to Helena. You will try to provide us with a short summary of the whole day. That will be uh, a starting point for our discussion. You will do that in a very compact and concise way, and then we are going to have the opportunity to reflect upon a few things, and then perhaps uh, also answer or ask rather one or the other. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will try to uh, make a short summary. Uh, well, uh, of the of the day, which will be like uh, like. Um, like a shortened version, so obviously, like the discussions were more broad, but uh, we were concerned with uh, with the notion or with the term modern modernism and functionalism, which um, uh, which Mrs. Mrs. Hein uh, was here like uh, defining since the 16th uh, uh, century, uh, based on rationalism. Then also the beginnings she saw in this like uh, garden bewegung, which is the garden garden movement, and the English arts and crafts. To that we heard like the wonderful presentation by Vendula, who was also um, uh, exploring this unknown modernisms uh, and this like not so clear modernisms. Um, and then we also. Uh, so the definition of Mrs. Hein uh, in this like em emancipatory modernism, which is a, actually a new term and a very interesting term, which we could also like go on until today to to see what what does it mean like uh, emancipatory modernism. Um, then we kind of uh, with uh, I think Mrs. Stortkul, uh, uh discussed this uh, idea of uh, multiple modernity. Um, how to um, how to explore uh, the whole um, the whole period from from nowadays um, that was on on one hand that we have to be careful about the terms how they were used in in these times of the 1920s and on the on the other hand uh, we have to see from from today's perspective what does it for us uh, make sense to to be looking at um, like the different questions we we uh, we spoke about, where this internationalism of modernism, which was mostly um, welcomed by the by the architects uh, and also by the states. On the other hand, uh, modernism became like speaking within this debate of multiple modernities. Uh, modernism became also an instrument of of nationalism of of state. Um, of a state image and uh, an expression, which uh, one could also see like critically. Um, then, uh, then the third aspect, uh, except for this international uh, architects' networks and uh, the nationalist uh, sort of aim uh, or take on modernism, we were speaking about this uh, garden movement um, as, as socially as socially oriented, not very uh, well known chapter of modernism and then uh, with the, the lecture of um, Mrs. Stördkul we, uh, we learned that uh, functionalism and Bauhaus was multiplicated through the region in, in those particular exhibitions uh, which was um, uh, as exemplary cases uh, Exhibited in in Brno, uh, in in Breslau at the Vuva and uh, in Poznan, and actually in this uh, whole uh, stream of thinking, there was also this Trade Fair Palace as an exemplary case, and also the Barcelona Pavilion, and um, and all of these uh, exhibitions had m multiple purposes, and it was interesting to see that the Barcelona Pavilion also stood for the modern image of the Weimar Republic. Mm. Except, um, except for that, we spoke about this uh, functionalism as an as an extreme modernism, uh, which was only accompanied by these different modernisms. Um, and um, and uh, after that, we heard uh, a lecture of Mrs. H Mr. Hilbert, um, who was kind of concerned with the conservative more. Uh, uh, reception after the World War II um, with the uh, uprising um, political, uh, different political situation 
and the um, and the debate uh, against uh, the architects Ehrlich and and Sharon on the on the example of the Leipzig Opera, where Kurt Liebknecht, uh, the um, the former scholar um, of uh, Ludwig Miss van der Rohe, was uh, was postulating the new architecture in the GDR uh, on based on like political and ideological um, um, trends and uh, and he was specifying the critique uh, of, of the Bauhaus mm. yeah like for me for the debate it would be interesting to really think and uh, think about what what would it mean to have like this uh, Emancipatorisches Bauen, um, emancipatory building, <laughs> also for for today's, for contemporary times, and uh, yeah, how to how to open up like some kind of a um, social perspective and um, yeah, of and contemporary um, perspective of just and emancipatory um, building. That was for my part. Okay, so I um, so if you would so I should say, I mean we're a very close group, if you like, and uh, for all of us, uh, and this is also something I want to say, this was a uh, thing that was certainly not uh, easy for all of us namely how we reacted to the fact that it was obviously difficult for Mr. Hilbert to make his presentation uh, the way he imagined. So I'm very grateful now uh, that Simone Hein made another beeline and uh, provided us with a different perspective of this whole topic because I think functionalism in this uh, controversy as we have perceived it and also in this context of national identity and so on, is of course a very different element and has a different uh, notion from what pre was presented here. This emancipatory aspect, and I, I think this is also this acceptance and taking on board of the modern, uh, of the better understanding of uh, modernism can be uh, adopted here. On the other hand, we see that bashed functionalism, and this is what we have seen in the East and the West. Mr. Hilpert, of course, um, uh, launched into the debate about the East, but there's also a debate of the West, and there's also a debate about the East, so I will also give you a few recommendations for books. Bauhaus Debate 53, this is really recommendable. I think it should have been distributed in advance um, at every Bauhaus institution as a little booklet for introduction, then this year would have been even more fruitful than it has been anyway. So this is, of course, the counterworks, Andreas Schätzke, uh, between Bauhaus and Stalinism, all the letters and all that that's uh, in there. So this is certainly something where Mr. Hilpert would also uh, affirm that it is important to, to uh, address these uh, connections in greater detail. So these two books, I think, would have uh, done very good to the German Bauhaus discourse. I actually um, I was very entertained. Uh, I mean, if you lead that thing of Schwarz, this is quite powerful. But also the way uh, writing uh, was performed in the 1950s. This is just very, very, um, it's a very high entertaining quality you know uh, these this culture of uh, responding and replying so without taking that any further I would also like to pass the floor to Mrs. Uh, Stortkul and Mrs. Littmann Englert and also to the two of you are there any questions that uh, now uh, wants to be asked to Mrs. Hein um, there's the microphone over there Please go ahead. From me also, uh, very, very many thanks uh, for speaking freely without uh, using the manuscript. This was really great as a wrap up. Now, my question is as follows. By the way, I also uh, nearly liked it that you didn't have any photographs. I mean, 
as we were all associating something with a name, but then I noticed Hannes Meyer, uh, Bruno Taut, and Egon Eiermann, if I hear these names, is uh, uh, oscillating because I'm uh, quite not quite sure what building I see in front of me. But here's another question regarding functionalism. If I correctly understood that, you were talking about Meyer, Taut, Eiermann as being in a line. Uh, and please correct me if I misunderstood that, but then you mainly worked from the basis of the social, that is the ideology of the social, and without the beauty or the uh, beauty of the human being uh, was emphasized by you as everyone now is very different in their style. I think this is a very exciting aspect. Could you say something about where, um, formulating that in a cheeky way, um, where the functionalist line is with the three in succession? This was quite a fast uh, part you covered. Can you say something uh, about that once more, please? The that was a quite uh, speedy part. Well, I wrote a uh, doctoral thesis about that, and they, of course, uh, are mentioned there in three different groups and so on, uh, in a line, if you like. So, Taut is an extremely interesting case because he had been bashed until Kurt Junghans, I mean, in the GDR, mit, mit uh, Tafuri, by the way, in an exchange, so Manfred Tafuri and the historians in the Building Academy uh, cooperated. So before Kurt Junghans in 1969 dug up Bruno Taut, he was regarded as a bore, as a, I mean, Taige said he used to be modern, but he dropped back totally, regraded. And specifically, according to the judgment of Tiger, is the uh, particularity of the Czechs I love, because they would never go without uh, an advanced design. Uh, the Czech modernism is based on a very progressed building industry and know-how. And with all the dissolution of form also uh, on the side of Tiger. No, he doesn't want a discussion about form. There are just functions in the hollow space and so on. He would never dispense with that and would never agree with Tout um, that uh, he is so traditionalistic. So with the Czechs, we are dealing with a very advanced top modernism that outperforms uh, many and is grand earlier than Germany. So they were really ahead, like 20T, Spanek, the university buildings, the medical, and in fact, so on. So you have to really be knowledgeable about that. And then you can say record, record, and so on. Czech modernism is so important also because they need to get detached from Austria and find their own cultural root and detach themselves of the Habsburg monarchy of the Renaissance uh, canon of style. Radically so, in a revolutionary and uh, aggressive process of shaking off the alien language, uh, delimiting themselves from the Otto Wagner school. Uh, and this is the role played by Cusum, Cubism, and this is incredibly important um, uh, on the Czech side as a liberation architecture, like the uh, Catalan modernism and Gaudi uh, are liberation architecture of the uh, Catalans. So this is one thing. Taut and um, Maya agree in one level in particular because in different ways uh, detach themselves of uh, the white modernism of concrete. The tout says I don't join that. The four-story brickwork building is ecologically, socially and so on the more stable one. He very early adopted criteria of sustainability. So you have to say that, uh, how as important as Gropius may have been, but this prefabrication, this building blocks, uh, he drove that into intellectual comfortism. And both as left-wing architects, Taut and Meyer uh, replace each other, Taut with Meyer, uh, even though Ertag was uh, called as a romantic, but Taut is the one who is uh, freer in his judgment. And then in the 1930s says, Hannes Meyer is our best architect in Germany. 
He just built one building. This is the one in Bernau. So this is the uh, impact of Bernau in these three years until the Nazis uh, uh, occupied it. All the architects went there. And Mrs. Hildebrand of Eiermann uh, said that the whole office had been out there several times in Bernau. And uh, Ayaman did that, and I don't see a big difference between Ayaman and Hayes Maya in, the, in their aesthetics. I really took a look at all of that, whether this is the yellow brick stone, whether it's the chairs and the tables, especially the Ayaman that in 1955 or 1956 at the Biennial in Milan appeared and becomes the Ayaman. These are the Italian uh, architects who accepted them. The Biennial was under the... Uh, headline of uh, aesthetics of work or spaces of work. Also, the Milan architects uh, were communists and they invite a German architect to participate under such a program. You just have to know in his last years of life uh, from Switzerland. Here is my hand, he says. And so they are not so far apart from each other. About uh, 1929, this had matured due to the world economic crisis, but also due to the uh, damages and cracks uh, that appeared. Uh, Dessau is an enormous catastrophe, economic catastrophe, so much damage and failures and also mis um, uh, mistakes in uh, the building process. Uh, the labor movement is not just a strike movement, but it's also an ideological organization. Somebody like Rudolf Steiner. Nobody to the present day has noticed that Hannes Meyer has submitted his ca his candidacy, his uh, application for a job as a, a close friend of uh, Rudolf Steiner, because this does not fit the picture of uh, the wolf in the sheep's skin. Gropius would like this. Well, he talks about the strong personal relationship with Rudolf Steiner in the time when he was not yet as an anthroposoph. Uh, here we come back again to this technique of passing. Rudolf Steiner is a teacher in the workers' school 1905-1907. He gave lectures in the House of Architects in Berlin endlessly. Bruno Jürgen, Richard Neutra, they all attended his lectures. Rudolf Steiner uh, explained uh, the a doctrine of 12 senses of a man. There is also a sense of reality. Hannes Meyer builds on this foundation, even though he parted ways uh, with uh, Rudolf Steiner. But uh, the later Steiner was no longer acceptable. Hannes Meyer and with, um, can explain only uh, by the fact that Rudolf Steiner and the uh, Anthroposophs uh, were under such heavy and fierce criticism that they could no longer be openly admitted to. And Rudolf Steiner, what he really contributed uh, to the social movement is his social theory. The three p components of the social that's uh, why the Baden-Württemberg uh, Soviet government wanted to appoint Rudolf Steiner as Minister of Labor in 1919. Rudolf Steiner, that we have lost sight of, who cooperates with the architects, he develops a co-determination model. He criticizes Marx by uh, presenting a different theory of uh, society based on existence scales, so a, a theory of minimum wage, guaranteed minimum, the theory of the third way, 1968, Otta Schick, you remember? Patochka, Vasha Narodny Program, 1968, the Prague Spring is a functionalist program, the third way is based on this idea. For mere hatred and bashing passion, we cannot see it, because, because all those uh, that studied uh, Hannes Meyer 
have uh, decried Rudolf Steiner as a funny marginal character, Paracelsus, Schlemmer paints a picture of Steiner as Paracelsus for the Bauhaus leather. It is quite often seen as a byword, but why is it that Paracelsus is so important for Bauhaus? You can, you will end up with Rudolf Steiner. So, we, ha we have an absolutely distorted image because we cannot see certain architects uh, as uh, close as they are. They are a family. Yes, then. So, uh, this is a broad uh, range of issues and also a deep insight. We can be very grateful for that. I'm always very impressed uh, by this multitude uh, of insights, uh, Ms. Hein. Any other question? Mr. Störtko? Yes, probably questions and also comments at the same time. Steiner is somebody who is very present in uh, the architects of the new building, Arading, for example, who wrote a history of building, building that has never been published, but the Academy of Arts, the Akademie der Künste, has it as a manuscript. You will find so many ideas of anthroposophy and uh, ideas uh, that go back to Rudolf Steiner. I think that should be studied more closely. The uh, question about those who died early. What does it mean if somebody can no longer speak on their own behalf? Like Bruno Taut, who died in 36, and Gropius uh, claim the full sovereignty on the interpretation of the entire movement because he uh, embarked on a great career in America and also he was a blessed uh, man of the world and from the 60s he dominated the discourse both in Western Germany, in West Germany anyway, but also in the GDR. He dominated it so much uh, that uh, to the present day we attach everything to the Bauhaus. I'm on my way uh, throughout the year to make a plea to look not only at Bauhaus. Therefore, also, we need to intensify the study of modernity in the eastern part of Europe, not only in Czechoslovakia, where it came to bear fruit so early, but we should also look closer uh, at expressionist architecture and the influences that come from Czech but still it is not seen it in its true relevance uh, the glasses of the history of architecture especially in Germany is very rosy and is very lopsided in favor of Bauhaus no no we need to unravel this uh, Yes, it's very one-sided, even within the Bauhaus. But uh, my, I, I've got two questions. The Meyer bashing by Gropius, yes, it's a matter of fact, but this dissatisfaction with Meyer and also this accusation, the allegation that he would gear up the Bauhaus in a too monodirectional way was also the accusation of the contemporaries. I listened very carefully because you stated that he had cooperated so closely with Schlemmer, but Schlemmer has been one of the critics of Hannes Meyer. He evaded to Breslau because he said it's too much of a good thing and it's too one-sided and he stated that uh, he hoped for more leeway in Breslau where there is no clear prescription or Oscar Moll. He also takes uh, Muche from Dessau to Breslau. Can you elaborate on this briefly? I would also like to come back to the theory of uh, the Calvinist and reformatory functionalists. Briefly, we do have a very strong modern movement, a Neues uh, Bauen, New Building, Modernism, Functionalism in very Catholic countries, such as in Poland or Lithuania. 
where modernism was also seen as uh, the representation of the state, especially in the 30s. So I would somehow contradict your view by asking you, isn't that a categorization that somehow slips down into this uh, curve, the Germanic and expressionist and abstracter Woringer, Woringer, and on the other hand, the eternal classic, uh, the Mediterranean element. So, would you please respond to this? I would not uh, hammer this in stone, what I said. It's not an absolute statement. I would, uh, but I think the ideological or religious foundations uh, are somehow on an anchor. The Basel Rotterdam story, back and forth on the Rhine at this, well, we have clusters. It's also about Matsdam in Holland, who brings uh, the Dutch to Switzerland in Basel, where you have uh, the spokespersons of this huge movement. But you would have to study more carefully whether this is in principle uh, watertight what the accompanying motives are or the deeper uh, subconscious uh, impulses that architecture might uh, uh, make architecture into a sort of expression. And the other story was Schlemmer. Yes, well, Schlemmer, there is one happy year between Meyer and Schlemmer. It's always uh, hidden. Read the diaries of Schlemmer. And then you see a sort of a fusion when Meyer was a new man, when they incorporate a merger of the various genres. Uh, Meyer, before co op, uh, staged theatrical pieces. He also wrote theatrical pieces. When he gave the job to Schlemmer to talk about man, to develop an anthropology. Schlemmer feels he's in high esteem. I think it must be down to a certain speech when Schlemmer said, this, this is a rural villain. He's too primitive. And he turns away from him. So I think uh, there are different moments in uh, the meeting of the two men. But Bauhaus was never as good as when there was an electric movement. Uh, moment between the two, 1927-28, when they staged common theater productions. We have diary entries. And Schlemmer expresses a huge hope and expresses also a deep and dense relationship. Thank you. A somewhat different question to Wendelow. I know that uh, you ha have uh, studied Sorella in Czechoslovakia. My question is, has there been any critical debate, uh, 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 a sort of bashing of functionalism in Czechoslovakia? What was it like and who were the protagonists? We need this. In my view, there was not a huge debate going on. It was a direction, a prescription. You can read it in the magazines and journals how the ex-functionalists uh, uh, make a plea to the contrary. Sorry. I will no, switch no. to English. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, we have the translation. Whatever you feel uh, fine, it's like we don't... Maybe it's even easier for me to stay in one language instead of changing. Yeah, no, it, it, you, you both, you have to arrange. That's I can speak Czech. Okay, speak Czech. No, no, we don't have translation from no, Czech. No, well, I'm not th that big expert for uh, the period, but uh, there were not so many uh, architectural journals. And those existing were replaced by, like... Um, Czechoslovak journal called Sovietska Architektura, so Sovietische Architektur, Soviet Architecture, I'm sorry. <laughs> too, feel it, uh, too many languages. Um, so, uh, there, were, there was like um, one 
chief victim of that uh, uh, campaign, and that was Le Corbusier. Uh, that he was like the uh, chief protagonist of uh, modern movement and as this he was victimized. So instead of naming uh, some or any of Czechoslovak architects, they replaced their friends with Le Corbusier being like the chief enemy. And it's like the key meaning of those discussions. So as it was also a generation conflict, like everywhere. The, the upcoming generation of young architecture students were gaining power against their professors. And the professors, in order to survive, needed to change their visuality, a certain strategy. So what they did, and I found that explicitly in Karel Honzik, who was one of the leading uh, protagonists of functionalism in Czechoslovakia. So he, with a theme of architect, architects, designed a um, uh, housing estate in Kladno, which is a um, mining district in the vicinity of Prague. And it was a perfect uh, fulfillment of uh, principles of modern architecture according to Le Corbusier. And it was designed in 1948. And then after the communist coup, he, with other group of architects, redesigned the very same housing estate, replacing really spectacular functionalism with socialist realism. And because it was such a brief switch in the visual language, I think nobody actually understood or comprehended why it was accepted. So what he did, when they were making like some uh, architectural statements about their intentions, they used um, quotations from Soviet theoreticians of socialist realism. So instead of uh, saying it in their own words, they advocated by the Soviets. So it was like their strategy. Well, actually, there, there were some speakers uh, for socialist realism, like Jiří Kroha, for example, who was more you know, uh, an architect by word than by act, you know, at that time, because he was not actually, uh, when he started, and this was also my question maybe to you, because uh, you introduced uh, the <coughs> thesis of modernism, the birth of modernism back to the 16th century, uh, 17th, sorry, 18th century, sorry, 18th century. But uh, what was the parting with modernism like in the Eastern Germany? Because in, uh, in um, Czechoslovakia, for example, um, Jiří Kroha, also a modernist, then uh, he tried to learn socialist realism. He was uh, advocating socialist realism in his text. And he uh, designed the fac new f building for the Faculty of Architecture. And this is maybe something similar to what Karel Honzik did, but uh, Kroha only in, the, in his project. He uh, designed a purely functionalist building at, and at, to make it socialist realism. He added two Corinthian columns to the facade, which was a symbol <laughs> of the parting with uh, modernism. But there were young architects like Vladimir Machonin, you know, one of the designers of the Czech Embassy in, in Berlin. Uh, he was very aggressive, you know, in his critique of uh, Kroha, that he was not a true socialist realist, that he was still a modernist trying to learn, you know, very, maybe in an embarrassing way, you know, what, what they thought was an embarrassing way to, to implement socialist realist. Um, uh, nomenclature, let's say. So it's a, a different conference. That's also why I was getting nervous when Tito Hilbert delivered his speech. Yes, it's a political factor. I've tried to dive underneath well, all this entire reaction by Gropius to Hannes Meyer cannot be understood without the political underpinnings. Madonado asks Gropius sometime around 67 when he attends the Ulm from 
Why are you so up in arms against Hannes Meyer? Die Zeit, uh, the weekly journal, uh, uh, has a wonderful article. Who is afraid of Hannes Meyer? 1966. So, ever since then, it's uh, the elephant in the room. Who is afraid of whom? Who uh, is afraid of somebody coming back from Mexico? Uh, so, so people who spoil the youth, uh, schools were battlegrounds, uh, the education or training of architects. Uh, this is an extremely politicized battleground inside the left, more or less. Uh, they all refer to Karl Marx, uh, some as a majority socialist, uh, then anarchists, anarchos, and Landauer Mühsam. All those uh, people have uh, found their origin in Steiner. So the left is so splintered uh, and split up because uh, since 1918 it has to, to do with Mies van der Rohe. My next project will be Mies van der Rohe because he was also bashed to the extreme as a right-wing architect and as a the destroyer of the Bauhaus, Mies van der Rohe, in, 19, in 1918 there was a massive uh, murderous campaign, uh, a civil war behind the Alexanderplatz, uh, there were shootings on and a uh, mass of suicides at the beginning of 1919 in the era when uh, the Bauhaus was established, Taut said, I do not want to play along these lines. Uh, it was tailored to tout uh, the betrayal of the USPD. Scheidemann Ebert, he could never pardon this. The soil reform, a uh, political run up. Run up in 1918. The civil war starts. It never ends, and the architects are all involved. Uh, Gropius uh, probably for his political opposition against Meyer, who supposedly became a communist. But the communists never accepted Meyer as one of their own. His uh, students uh, that are members of the Communist Party say, Meyer is never a communist, uh, the Bauhaus bashes Meyer, because they say he's a syndicalist, he's an anarchist. Krapotkin, uh, just like Karl Teige, Karl Teige was accused of Trotskism. So these are sectarian fights. It's not about architecture. It was not about architecture. It was about the camp represented by Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe was anarchist and revolutionary. And he also acted as a counselor for the revolutionary workers. He's an anarchist. He creates this famous monument to Luxembourg and Liebknecht. That cannot be explained but because he had a very strong friendship with the family of Liebknecht. There's one architect of modernity on whom there was never a critical word. That's Mies van der Rohe, Liebknecht, uh, who was decried as an, uh, an, a heretic. Still, he leaves out the monument. They didn't have the plans. Of course it was supposed to be rebuilt. So that was not a political act, no, not at all. In uh, the last months of his life, I interviewed Liebknecht. Uh, I uh, visited him quite often. He uh, welled up in tears uh, in my, our eye-to-eye -eye conversations. Uh, I have to ask you for repentance, or you do not repentance. Uh, to whom do you have to be repentant? Well, the man, this man coming from Soviet Union, Stalin would never have stopped short of murdering uh, Liebknecht. Dimitrov uh, rescued him from the camp. He was really afraid of the Russians. He came. To whom has he uh, con make a confession? Mazdam and uh, the critic Deli Hotskaya. They had lived together in Moscow. They had uh, Gretel Schütte from Vienna Mazdam. They were kicked out of the door as modernists, as communists. Uh, Nobody can understand that without a true and detailed knowledge of the conflicts inside the German 
leftist. Uh, it's uh, full of uh, splits and splinters. And, and uh, it's also important to note, I do not know whether Karl Teige in 1937, 1930, Hannes Meyer was here in 1936, uh, they drive through Czechoslovakia. Nobody understands how Maya can praise everything that go is going on in the Soviet Union. The Czechs Karl Honzik criticize him. Later, Karl Honzik uh, will then be uh, accused of being a right-wing communist. Hannes Meyer probably had the chance to, uh, to meet uh, with Karl Teige and to tell him what's really going on in the Soviet Union. Taige publishes in 1937 uh, Surrealism Protki Plodu, a uh, uh, writing that to the present day is considered to be the most poignant and heated uh, coming to terms with Stalinism. It's not Arthur Köstler. Nobody uh, was as uh, he equals uh, fascism and Stalinism. This kills also Karel Teige, Kali Voda, Honsig. He is excluded from the left. The captain of the avant-garde uh, is, uh, uh, is excluded uh, because he has criticized Stalin. Mukashovsky also joins Stalin. So many things that cannot be explained with architecture. Thank you very much. I believe this uh, opened another uh, window to another aspect. Playing through the architectural discourse only because you also need that level. And I'm also wondering when we get back to our initial question, and uh, perhaps this is a good wrap up for uh, tonight, why? Or uh, let me rephrase that. Why is that so with functionalism? Ms. Sturtkohl just said, and I think we're all similar in this way, at least those who sit here from the German side. We, in this Bauhaus year, uh, direct our gaze to the Czech Republic with interest. And we do that because we don't want to be totally satisfied with this label Bauhaus for modernism. So we look there and we look into this rich functionalism and we are enthused with that. And through this gaze over there, we see that uh, diversity and modernism and uh, Bauhaus is not sufficient to us and we wonder why is it that we don't uh, see a very natural link in this broad reception an exchange with this Czech functionalism and Czech modernism and with uh, modernism in Central Europe. Of course, you can say, sure, in the Bauhaus year, um, this is, of course, uh, easy to accept uh, that label and you can work with it. This is certainly also a political decision, uh, you know, to fill such a year. When we look back from when on the Bauhaus uh, Interest, the interest in the Bauhaus uh, started and was reinforced and uh, strengthened. This, of course, also came about in a certain societal constellation. And sure, okay, we have arrived here, and now we take that look and we wonder while we're having such an event and uh, look into this uh, subject of functionalism, we notice, okay, this term, functionalism has some tricky connotations. And now, after we have listened to all that, we can again wonder why this is so and why this is not automatically, I mean, why we are missing this. Why this co-involvement of functionalism in such a Bauhaus year, why do we miss that? Is this due to the interwar war period? Is this due to the uh, reception uh, in the post-war period? And like, uh, like Thilo Hilpert uh, described that. And I believe perhaps also the different uh, 
kind of reception of functionalism in the Czech Republic and Germany is also due to the fact that, uh, that is these differences in reception, that we um, have experienced functionalism as a town planning functionalism, that is through these large scale residential estates we see as problematic. When I walk through Prague, I see a wealth of functionalist buildings which are not just somewhere in a settlement. I mean, the settlements of the 20s uh, reach our consciousness only now. They are uh, also something, they're just there, we don't experience them. Is that the reason that there is a different diversity, a different critical mass already in the interwar period that um, gave the opportunity of building a different uh, kind of identification with that? So what is it due to that we have reached this point here and now, and on the one hand find the term difficult, on the other hand, don't want to be satisfied with Bauhaus and the Bauhaus year, but look, take a good look at the Czech functionalism. And we are not the first and only ones who do that, as we have heard. So this is something I would like uh, to see as an initial statement for a final round. And everyone may as well say, I didn't understand your questions, or they may say what they think about that. Perhaps uh, also in the way we discuss it between us. I mean, Helena said, okay, my perception is slowly different from yours here in Germany for this uh, reception. So how do we want to walk around this way or that way? Or who wants to begin? Please uh, tell me. So let's have another round. I just passed the floor to Ms. Dirtkuhl now. Well, I believe this has a lot to do with the post-war period, especially with the Iron Curtain. The look to the east, at least from the Western perspective, and I'm not solely talking about Western Germany here, but generally, the Anglo-Saxon world has um, what happened behind the Iron Curtain not taken note of what happened there for a long time because it was difficult to go there. And this is certainly one of the main reasons why we lost sight of that. That is, this very close connection we did have in the decades and centuries before, and intensely so in the interwar period, where all these uh, uh, modernity movements very closely collaborated, not just the architects, also the artists in general did that. So this co-working, this through the Second World War and its consequences drifted apart. The second point is certainly that for a very long time, through the modernism in Eastern and Central Europe was written in Polish and in Czech. In the past 10 to 20 years, this has changed. There's also a lot about the uh, Czechoslovak uh, interwar architecture available also in the English language. But for instance, about the Polish modernism or the Lithuanian modernism, this is a phenomenon that has only in the past five years that we can read things about that in English or in German. And this does make the whole thing more difficult. So it's very much a matter of uh, the opportunities for reception. Why we lost sight of that? And the second point that has been repeatedly addressed here, the sovereignty of interpretation, who said what and when it was heard and who could no longer say something like uh, Bruno Taut or Adolf Rating or also people who r wrote less. Hans Scharoun, even though he was a fantastic architect and is uh, uh, at equally important as Walter Gropius, just published much less. Above all, he planned and he built things. So this is my thesis, if you like, what I want to like, what would like to put out. I have to confess, as I am not researching so much in Eastern Europe, I would like to uh, step away from that. I find your question interesting. And what about the West? No, just leave it at that. It's also about the post-war debate. I'm not an expert on German reception of Czechoslovak architecture. But on the Czech one. <laughs> but uh, I have like um, two comments. I think that uh, in the interwar period, the Czech, I omit the Slovaks intentionally, the Czech architects 
were pretty well connected. The international network was very intense and they belonged in that. A couple of years ago, I went to Stockholm to do some research on Sven Markelius. And in his files, I found documents on Josef Havlíček and Karel Honzík, to my great astonishment. <laughs> so they were really perfectly connected into the international avant-garde. But when uh, Hitchcock published his uh, canonic book on uh, international style in 1932, there is only one example from Czechoslovakia, and it's Josef Kranz from Brno, his cafe era. So I think they were like missing from the very beginning. So it's maybe the very common problem of centers and peripheries. That's still not... Well, it's a center for Central Europe, but uh, somehow I still think that uh, although they had so many friends and they were published in journals and they exchanged correspondence still from the American perspective that took the shape after the war, they were missing. And I think there is like the very beginning of it. Well, I also did some <laughs> research of uh, the reception of uh, Czechoslovak modernism abroad. And I realized that actually, let's say for Brno where I live and I, I, I do my research, that only in 1967, when there was the, um, um, the Congress of Union Internacional des Architects, you know, they uh, met in Prague. And it was a time when um, the art historians in, in Brno uh, united and they wrote um, something like a guide uh, through modernist uh, for modernist architecture, uh, ending with the entry for Lesna housing estate, where actually the group of international architects was um, invited, you know, to represent some, after the end of socialist realism, some like exquisite example of uh, post-war architecture, of the new birth of modernism, the post-war modernism. And so Lesna was uh, a housing estate for 20,000 people. It was awarded by Czechoslovak government to be a very successful project. And it was the first mass housing project, you know, from the 60s and uh, the guide was written and it was translated into several languages like Russian, French, um, German and English and actually <laughs> yeah, I think Vendula earlier suggested that in uh, 1990s after the Velvet Revolution <laughs> that actually something like um, what, what I call um, sentimental neo-functionalism, neo you know, became a trend and it still is because this, these are still the same architects, the generation who worked for Stavo projects, you know, and then all of a sudden after the, uh, the, the Velvet Revolution, they were able to design what they would like to <laughs> on private. So they turned back to functionalism. And, you know, they also, I think it's also a problem of not only terminology, but the, the subject of, of the study is that the, the history of Czechoslovak architecture, the, the modernist one, was written by architects, <laughs> not, not uh, architecture historians. So I think we have to do something about that because they tended to omit um, some important facts about the 50s, for example. They, they wrote uh, like uh, monographs, biographies of uh, the interwar architects, uh, like omitting the 50s and it seems like, you know, the architects, the architects' lives and careers ended in 1945, which is not true at all. So we have to fill uh, these gaps. But why am I talking about that? <laughs> that when uh, some, you know, I won't name them, name them researchers, they wrote uh, a small handbooks on functionalist architecture in Brno. They used 
uh, mostly uh, they took information from the handbook, from the guide from 1967. <laughs> so it was almost completely uh, took over without any, uh, I don't know, uh, without updating the information and so on. So, yeah, so I think that uh, in the 60s uh, there was some new revival of research or functionalism for maybe international public, but it uh, somehow was connected to the fact that uh, there was an international group, group of uh, architects and architecture historians coming to Prague, and it was very important. Well, I would add something to this whole uh, story. First of all, I should say it has all political reasons. Functionalism was uh, at happening at the same time like communism, and it has been identified too strongly with it. To a certain extent, this, uh, there is some truth in it. It's embedded in a modern radicalization, as I would put it. And the Czech avant-garde was leftist in a way um, that we did not see another time in Europe. So leading to the Communist Party of uh, Czechoslovakia had authority in the 1930s. From Germany, no one can imagine that. So, from my perspective, on the one end, this has political reasons, and secondly, I mean, I wrote a text about that. The uh, trilogy uh, of m uh, modernism, uh, Lampa Lamponiani, his concept, and he invited me to write something about the post-war modernism, and uh, I got a bit mad and uh, replied to him, Ex Orient Lux, Germany at the East, is the title of the text I wrote in response, and I am totally uh, along this line. I mean, there was a conscious ostracization. This Warnum uh, Koroschwanski wrote and wrote and also published in German. But a Moroschwanski uh, was not read in Germany by no colleague, and the uh, German architectural history was so massively influenced by Werner Dutt with this uh, eternal uh, our zero and the post modern. I mean, the Dutch uh, colleagues are shaking their head. What was going on in the German architectural history for a long time? That is, dominant persons with their research interests. And in this case, in uh, the Czech uh, Republic, I would also agree. I have always uh, sh uh, come into dispute with these uh, uh, colleagues like Schumpeter and Kudek, that was uh, my professor, I mean, about the fact that there was no art history, that there was no broader discourse in their understanding. And I, this, uh, I do think this is anti-communism. So it is the reduction of all contexts, all programmatic journals and Schlappeter in the national Czech modernism exported in a whitewashed form that was netted off the political aspect. I mean, uh, for, for, the, for the ending, I would like to say like, thank you, because I think this is really in, uh, important to like, maybe start and, and try to reconnect these histories that have been like, interrupted. And, and since like, there is this like, 30 years of the fall of the Iron Curtain and, uh, and for 15 years these countries of Central Europe have been in the European Union. Um, We're I'm still reconnecting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm also like um, with this different like encyclopedic uh, works, you know, always like um, kind, of, uh, kind of surprised how, how the region is still kind of being neglected and, uh, and, and I mean it's, it's important to, to try to yeah, like um, discuss and, and like find uh, find new new contacts and new networks. So so thank you all for these uh, really interesting inputs and um, and um, yeah and new thoughts how to define these types of m multiple modernities and so on. Also, uh, from my end, a uh, cordial thank you. Thank you very much for your brief summary, Helena. And I think uh, probably we have approached the problem by some 
distances if uh, we just uh, trigger Simone Hein. We will probably have uh, more opportunities uh, very briefly. Please give uh, It may look so simple. In my generation, I am surrounded by architects. Uh, my sisters in law, uh, they uh, were all architects. They went to Breslau. They, for them, it was a revolution. In East Germany, things are somewhat different. Um, there was an interest in detecting something that had been decried as heretic. Uh, for example, functionalism, part of the history. That was a heretic uh, history. Uh, you could feel well when studying this. Yes, uh, so we notice it is still something that needs further discussion. I am deeply interested in this uh, to learn more about uh, your studies or your work that you have brought to a first apex with the conference that uh, was organized uh, at the beginning of this year. You will continue this here with the Bauhaus reuse we have adopted uh, the topic of uh, Bauhaus and modernity Bauhaus here in, in Central Europe uh, the district of uh, Charlottenburg has a vital interest in exchange with uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, even into further countries like uh, Ukraine and uh, Belarus Rebauhaus also stretches out to, to activities in Belarus. I would love to continue flashing up this network. I thank from the bottom of my I heart. I thank uh, both of you very much for you replacing um, Rostislav. I, 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 I don't think he could have done it any better. Um, um, as he was uh, invited as a commentator um, from Brno um, and uh, you did um, this very well and um, thank you so much for these insights uh, you gave us and the comments and uh, Vendula um, this is a really interesting uh, aspect um, so but in the end you also opened us your your knowledge uh, your, your very broad knowledge about the complete um, not only this new new spotlight on the, the gardening um, uh, movement, uh, gardening, uh, Gartenstadt movement, but also on the uh, on your broad expertise uh, on the Czech functionalism. It would be a, a, an attractive uh, thing to continue even after the Bauhaus. Uh, anniversary we have hardly talked about the Bauhaus anyway I do not uh, know in which camera you want me to hold this up we uh, this one here we want to recommend these books here let us start out by uh, the beginnings of functionalism by Posener that would be something that should be read then the two Bauhaus debates in 53 the uh, the debate about the Bauhaus with a foreword by Winfried Neerdinger, also because it's very funny and entertaining. The counterpart Andreas Schetzke from Bauhaus to Stalin Allee. Here you can find everything you need, inclusive of the 16 guiding principles and also the reconstruction law of the GDR. We talked about the Trade Fair Palace of the National Gallery in Prague, a topical book, but uh, it is still of extreme relevance because the National Gallery will probably be refurbished once they have found a new director. Then. Yet another beautiful book. It's one of the few books uh, that uh, has it in the title. The Bauhaus in Czechoslovakia by the colleague Marketa Svobodova, who we also addressed, but unfortunately she had uh, a totally different localization. So, um, unfortunately, only in the old book shops, uh, Mies and Post Porter, the, the Mannheim Theater by Thilo Hilpert. This is highly interesting. model. 
if it had been built back then, well, you don't know. Had if something had been, it's hypothetical. This century, century of modernity, you can find it only as a used book by Tilo Hilpert, uh, in, uh, published in 2016. You see how short thrifted our time is. Who felt uh, any inspiration by the Opera House in Leipzig? To learn more about opera in Eastern Europe, uh, we had an internal quarrel, uh, Helena and myself, whether there is anything like a communist opera. Wasn't that too bourgeois? And I said, no, the opera in Leipzig was built in the 50s. I won in one bit in a discussion on the history of architecture. Mr. Hilpert once again unraveled this once again. There was also a, a journal, Österreichische Musikzeitschrift, the Opera in East Europe. A very nice title. Whoever wants to learn more about the musical and managerial inner life and, and architecture between art and science, texts of Czech uh, uh, cultural avant-garde uh, by Ian Fetcher and Ulrich Winko. I can also highly recommend this. It's very, very thick. Last uh, but not least, uh, again, Ulrich Winko with Janet Fabian. At in memoriam Thomas Schwalenan, with whom I could write my diploma thesis, uh, unfortunately he died in February, this is Prague, Prague Architecture and the European Modernism. I think that's uh, a toolkit that uh, opens up your view on Central Europe. That was my conclusive remark. Now there is something to recommend. Well, it would be a good fit further uh, a call for paper. You will find it also on our homepage. Uh, that might be interesting for many young uh, scientists. Uh, on the 28th of May 2020, new building at the, on the Baltic Sea. In the southern Baltic Sea region, you can ha submit uh, your papers until the 31st of December. Very nice, yes, uh, we can also publicize uh, through our channels as the Triennale. Would you please send me this via mail? Then we will integrate it into our homepage for all the interested people. I think it is always an important uh, activity if you break it down to the level of uh, the students and liven it up. It's, uh, it uh, is very laudable. We will also pick up on this with Bauhaus News because the Technical University is one of our partners and it must be livened up. I, uh, yet another book that I did not have. I, I don't, for the Czech colleagues it's important. The Italians have always been very focused on the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. Unlike Germany, the catalogue uh, by Hanna Cizrashova in Trieste, uh, Karel Teige and Prague. This is a counterproof uh, that uh, shows that it is possible, it, it was possible. Uh, uh, my, uh, I have also a doctoral um, student who tells me it was always open and possible in Italy to talk about the Czech architecture. So thank you very much once again. If we do not receive any further interesting input, that should never be rejected. Well, unfortunately it is my task to call this uh, a day. I hereby announce the closing of this conference and I have, but for 10 minutes we have made full use, we have 10 minutes break. Whoever feels like it and uh, is willing to do so can watch two films, two movies, probably will we'll have an, another dedicated uh, film evening, the Pride Igo myth, uh, the end of modernity, Chad Friedrichs, uh, who commented it like this, but uh, 
the Pruitt Igo myth was built in those years from 50 to 56, when this entire debate was raging. It's highly interesting. It was uh, blasted in 1976. We uh, mentioned this year again and again. The 1972, the teardown was begun. That was exactly the moment uh, when, in the GDR, the housing construction was adopted or a plan, and the housing programs were finished. So it's interesting to see the synchronicities and also antagonists. And also a film about uh, the Haus Tugendhat the festival central of the Bauhaus reuse uh, the Triennale will be open tomorrow you can drop by tomorrow you can also watch this uh, video thank you very much uh, for your patience for your contributions have a safe trip home there is also a glass of wine whoever wants to join in and once again thank you very much to the entire team for the participation uh, and enjoy the evening. Bye-bye.